Welcome to Restoration Church, located in Goleta, California. To learn more about us, please visit r-church.org. To watch our service or join us via live stream, check out our YouTube channel by searching Restoration Church Goleta. Amen and amen. Ah. So for the sermon, we're just going to sit here in silent meditation, listening to the rain. Oh, man, that is a glorious sound. All right, if you would, please turn to 1 Corinthians 14. That's on page 916 in the Pew Bibles. We usually stand for the reading of God's Word, but we're going to walk through the entire chapter. So I'm going to, I'm going to read it through the sermon. So if you would, turn to 1 Corinthians 14, page 916 in the Pew Bibles. If you're listening online, I'm welcome. If you need a Bible, please send us an email or leave a note in the live stream and we'll send you a Bible. We will find a way. And we have the page numbers so that you're able to turn there in case you don't know way, your way around the Bible. If you would just hold your finger there until we get to the text. Today, we talk about Tongues. Bum, 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 bum. Everybody scared? Everybody put their seatbelts on. Here we go. All right, I'm going to pray for us. Pray for myself. In fact, if you could pray for me as I pray for us, I would appreciate that. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in agreement with Barb as she prayed that you would speak through me, would speak to me. Help me to prophetically speak your word to your people. Empower us by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God. We need you, especially in addressing such a controversial and sometimes dividing gift. We pray that you would open your word to us. We could very simply be pupils of your word. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Man. At one point in the sermon series, I talked about uh, when I was taught to speak in tongues. I just want to testify for a minute. So when I first came to Jesus, uh, I was involved in Assemblies of God Church, and they believe very strongly as the evidence of tongues as evidence of your salvation. And so I remember being in all these, in this group of people surrounded by a bunch of people that I all looked up to because I just wanted to try to be like Jesus and therefore be like them. And they were just like all laying their hands on me and oil was flowing and it was just kind of this crazy seed. And they're just like, open your mouth, just open your mouth. So I'm like, ah, ah, ah. you know, like, I don't know what to say. I have no idea. And then I just kind of started talking and they're like, yes. And they affirmed it and it was incredible. And I was like, yeah, but it wasn't really the gift of tongues. I was just peer pressured into thinking that, well, this is what all Christians do. Now, years later, this was years later, I was praying during worship. In fact, it was the same church that my wife and I met and got married at. And I remember in worship service, as we were singing, I was sitting and and I remember wrestling, yet wanting a deeper experience with God. And I was praying for the gift of tongues, that if it be real, that God would actually give it to me, that it would be different, that it would be something that I just didn't learn or like sound like everybody else, kind of should about a Hyundai kind of feel, like that kind of like rolling of the tongue that everybody sounds like when you go to a more Pentecostal church. And it wasn't the first time I had prayed for this. God, if this is real, give me the gift of tongues. I prayed, and that morning, I spoke in tongues, and it was different than what I had been taught. It was different from what I had been taught and wasn't, it wasn't contrived or peer pressured. It truly was a gift, and so I spoke in tongues for quite a few years, spoke in tongues for quite a few years, and yet, a few years later, after that, I started studying cessationism, which means that the gift of prophecy and tongues have ceased. And I put these unexplainable gifts on the shelf and took a hard look to see if they were actually biblical or if it was something I was just taught. After a few months, I took them back off the shelf and have been speaking in tongues as a private prayer language ever since. Not because of my experiences, but because I believe the Bible makes a strong enough case for tongues being active and present in our new covenant age. Until the return of Christ. 
Yet because there are good studies on both sides of the biblical table with this, I hold it with humility. I have good friends and mentors that would say that this gift no longer exists, at which I smile and say, have you ever read 1 Corinthians 14? These are pastors that I say this to, and then we laugh. This is not a subject to divide over. Why? Because it's a secondary issue. And so, if you hold a view contrary to what I'm about to teach, then I'm okay with that. I'll admit, tongues are weird. Amen? And a little mysterious. They have been abused, mistaught, and done in a non-biblical way a whole lot. So I get it. I get it. But here's what I would ask, which is not a new request. This was the request that I had in the very beginning as we started studying spiritual gifts. The blank slide up on the screen. Let's try, in so much as it's up to us, start with a clean slate. Try and remove all the assumptions, the misuses and abuses, the experiences, whether good or bad, and let's simply examine our text this morning to see if these things be true. Maybe take up the spirit of the Bereans, which is a story in Acts when they first heard about Jesus. They didn't just immediately believe. They began to open the scriptures and examine for themselves. And that's what I hope to do this morning. Now, the context of 1 Corinthians 14, and the reason why we have such great detail about the gift of prophecy in tongues is because of their misuse, which I find very interesting, which should give us a clue that the fact that just within the first century, within a few decades of Jesus coming, Paul preaching, taking the gospel to all around the known world at the time, and and these churches are being planted and pastors are being raised up, just shortly thereafter, we see tongues being misused, which should give us a certain check in our own souls, a clue of the possibility of our ship going off course. It's just particularly easy when it comes to tongues and prophecy. And Paul is writing in response to a letter the church wrote to him, and he's answering their questions. Many of us may not know that. Now, we don't have the letter, and so we don't know exactly what was asked, but we can assume his response, which is 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, these are his responses to the letter that they wrote him. In fact, the New Living Translation takes the liberty by adding your question in chapter 12, verse 1. It says, now, dear brothers, regarding your question, which isn't in the original Greek, but because it's a loose translation, New Living Translation, they put that in there because that is the context. He's answering a question. Dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, in other words, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I don't want you to misunderstand this. Clearly, the context of the chapters of spiritual gifts. Now, we're not sure of their question. We don't know or don't have the letter, as I said. But it would seem that there were abuses specifically regarding tongues in two ways. One, that we've talked about before, spiritual arrogance. And two, a misuse in church gatherings. In other words, what we have here among us, a gathering of the saints, that there was misuse within church gatherings, which is awesome. I hate to say that, like I'm stoked that they really jacked it up, but the reason why is because we get very specific details on how to use prophecy in tongues within the context of the church. Now, what are tongues? The Greek word, uh, glossia, means that it's a, it means in its basic form, just simply means a tongue, as some of you are sticking out your tongues right now, or a language. It means a tongue or a language. Now, the Greek lexicon says about this same word, says this. I'm just going to read this to you. An utterance having the form of language but requiring an inspired interpreter for an understanding of the context. Listen to this. Most scholars assume that the phenomena described in Acts 2.4. Now, let's go back to what happened in Acts 2.4. The church is just starting. And so what happens is Jesus rises from the dead. He says, go and pray. They go into the upper room and pray. And as they're praying in one accord, according to the scriptures, there's a, there's like a wind going on, in case you weren't sure what that sound 
bite was. That's was like a wind, something serious going on. And all of a sudden, they started to speak with tongues of fire, it says. Like there's this sense of like something crazy, and they all come out of the upper room, and they're, they're saying things they don't understand, which is crazy. But at the time, there was a feast going on, and people from all over the known world were coming to this Jewish feast, and they heard the wonders and the glories of God being spoken by these uneducated Galileans miraculous now that's what happened in acts 2 4 but in acts 14 2 most scholars significantly see a difference in that one instance people understood in their own regional language or dialect and in another instance an interpreter was required it is for that reason that many interpret tongues as we see in scripture in first corinthians 14 2 as a static speech which is also an element in Hellenistic religions and constituted a symbol of divine inspiration. Now, why is that so important? Because some say that tongues are a pagan practice. I've heard it, been told that myself. I remember when tongues became personal, prayer language of tongues became a very um, uh, dominant area as when I was in India. I went on India on an emissions trip and I felt the oppression. I felt the idolatry worship. And not only did I feel it, you could see it. It was all around. People bowing before a statue, shaving their heads, saving their hair, jumping in the water and doing all these things for a statue of a God, the multiplicity of gods that they worshiped in our area that we were visiting. And I found myself speaking in tongues. I remember coming back from that mission trip, talking to, at the time, our lead pastor, who said, be careful, that might be from the devil. And the reason why he said that was because of this. That back in the first century, the babbling or ecstatic speech was a pagan practice. And so we ought to be careful. Which is in this context, which is why some might say this, that tongues are a pagan practice and ecstatic speech inspired by the demonic. At this point, since it's defined as not understood by the speaker, I'm going to go ahead and finish the sermon in tongues and pray that you can interpret it yourself. <laughs> Good luck. Just kidding. Some of you are a little scared. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 14, chapter, one, or chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understand him, understands him, but he speaks, he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So what do we learn? Tongues speak not to man, but to God, okay? Tongues speak not to man, but to God. Okay, you guys got that? Now, prophecy, we've studied prophecy, prophecy part one and part two. Please look it up on the website so you can revisit that because it speaks a lot about prophecy in our text, but we're just focused on tongues. Go back and listen to that sermon. Prophecy is from God to man. Tongues is to God from man. You see the difference. You guys with me? All right. So prophecy is from God. Number one, tongues speak to God. Number one, Tongues speak to God. Jake, you on that? There we go. And number two, what do they speak? What is he speaking? Speaks mysteries in the spirit. Now, don't miss this, though. It's always important that as you go through the text, you see what is truth and what is command. What is, what is an indicative? In other words, a truth statement or a command. And our command in our text this morning, which I believe is kind of an umbrella over it all, says pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So identifying, stewarding, and glorifying God with the gifts you have been given, I'm gonna go so far as to say it starts with an earnest desire to do so. It starts with an earnest desire to do so. To pursue love as a priority, as 1 Corinthians just laid out quite beautifully for us, that he puts chapter 13 in the middle of these two conversations about all these different spiritual gifts and says, don't forget love. And then right after that, he says, pursue love. So one, pursue love. Two, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. That would include 
the gift of tongues. And it starts with that. Verse four. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now Paul does not say this in a demeaning fashion. In other words, in some of the commentaries I read from a cessationist perspective that these gifts have ceased, they said, and they say, see, it, all it does is build up yourself. The gifts are about building up the church. Therefore, this gift should be thrown out. But that's as silly as I studied that and I was like, what? That's as silly as saying we should never have individual devotions and prayer times for self edification. Like we should just take the words of Jesus when he says, go and pray in secret. Go into your closet and pray in secret for the God who sees you in secret will reward you openly. We should just white out that verse? No. No. So what we see next is that tongues are to increase your potential. Now, we've seen this. The word building up definition right up on the screen says to increase the potential of someone. So tongues are for building up yourself, Okay. And building up means to increase the potential of someone to strengthen, to make more able, to build up. That comes straight from the Greek. So tongues are to increase your potential individually so that you may then serve the body of Christ with greater strength. This has been my experience as well. And so number three, it increases your potential to serve the church. Tongues speak to God, speak mysteries in the spirit, and increases your potential to serve the church. What he is saying, however, that in the context of a church gathering, unless, uh, because tongues are for self-edification, they should be kept to yourself unless there is an interpreter. And so what is the gift of interpretation of tongues? See this right up on the screen. You guys catching up? You with me? All right. Interpretation of tongues. Reporting to the church the general meaning of something spoken in tongues. Paul then puts the gift of tongues interpreted on even worth as prophecy because why? Because they build up the church. And so say, for instance, if someone spoke in tongues right now. Everybody got their seatbelts on? If someone spoke in tongues right now, what we would do is ask for an interpretation. And if someone had an interpretation, we would consider it like a prophecy. It would be a word for our church. But just like prophecies, we would sift it. We would go, is this truly a word from the Lord? And the elders would gather the, prof- the word of the prophets is subject to the prophets, and so we would collectively go, like affirm or deny whether that word was for the church. That's how these things work. I don't want you to miss verse five, though. Let me read this again. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues. Huh. Interesting. So, number four, Paul expressly desires all to speak in tongues. You're welcome. But here's the thing. Even though Paul expressly desires that, he knows that not all of us will. And what we don't want to do is set ourselves up like the church in Corinth did, that those that speak in tongues are more spiritual, more mature, more in touch with the spirit, those kind of things, because that's what was happening. Again, like I referred to last week, it's just like, oh, do you speak in tongues? Oh, you don't. Mm, I'll pray for you, brother. Like that spiritual arrogance that comes about. Because he says, look up on the screen. We talked about the same verse last week. There are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given. And then he goes through and says, prophecy, service, tongues, all the different gifts. In other words, not all, not everyone is going to have all the gifts So some won't speak in tongues, and that's okay. The scriptures give permission towards that. It's not an evidence. What an evidence of of salvation is, is the fruit of your life via the power of the Holy Spirit. Tongues is one of an evidence of. And so, 
Let's go back to desire. I think some of us can't ident- or don't identify the gifts that God has for us because maybe we've seen the abuses and we're scared as we've seen in our congregation. I know there's fear involved or hurt or pain, but the hope is, is that you would come back and actually desire these things in your spiritual life. But don't neglect the fact that Paul says in number four, Paul expressly desires all to speak in tongues. It goes on to list the gifts as we talked about in that text. Um, But one thing we learned for sure, it's not something we should reject. Tongues is not something we should reject. So let's review. We are called to pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Tongues speak to God, speak mysteries in the spirit, increases your potential to serve in the local church, and Paul expressly desires all to speak in tongues. Let's go to verse six. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Even if lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with you yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and a speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager to, for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. And what you're gonna see is two kind of commands in between the information about tongues. So pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. This is what tongues is. But then don't forget, strive to excel in building up the church. And they both serve as, again, kind of this north, if you will, this compass to guide us as we, as we negotiate through these things. And Paul is making such a strong, and he's gonna continue the same argument. He's basically like, do not speak in tongues in the congregation, in the gathering, in the church, unless there's an interpreter. That's what he's saying. Don't do that except for a private prayer language, which I was doing this morning, during worship, singing and praising, under my voice. No one's hearing, no one's freaking out. But I'm praying in the spirit. I'm praying in tongues, just right over there. So you might not want to sit over there. You might, get, you might get infected by the Spirit. I'm just kidding. Strive to excel in building up the church. And since tongues, unless interpreted, is for increasing your own potential, in prayer or praise in tongues to yourself within in gathering, he goes on to make his point. Look at verse 13. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will, I will, I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen or so be it to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may well be giving thanks or you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Love that saying. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Than 10,000 words in a tongue. What I want to point in there is the first verse. Look back at 13. This should blow some of your minds. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. And it's one of the things that I've had to relearn. Do you remember when like, I had that blank, blank screen up there? Like we gotta re, like, let's, let's revisit the scriptures afresh and anew. One of the things that's always bothered me growing up in different Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches and things like that is someone that would speak a tongue and then interpret it right afterwards. I was always like, nah, I don't know. 
Didn't that, doesn't that seem kind of shady? Like, there's no way to like verify that. It doesn't seem mystical. It just seems like you're trying to make, maybe promote your way. And I had to repent. Why? Because it says right here, if you have the gift of tongues, you should pray that you can interpret. And I do have to testify. I might get kicked out for this one. I don't know. We'll see. I was praying. I go on prayer walks often with my dog, pray through our neighborhood, seeking Jesus, asking God to search my heart, praising him for the stars or the foggy nights and all these different things. And, and oftentimes I'll start my prayer as I walk up this hill, speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. And reading in this verse as we first started this series, I started praying, God, would you give me an interpretation with my tongue? Like I wanna know what I'm being, what's being said. And so then I went up, as I go up, and I just, I, I didn't have a ton of time that night. I had to go home and pray with my kids and stuff. So I went and walked to the spot where I usually kind of pray over the city. And I just said, God, thank you for this city. And usually I'm like praying against strongholds and praying against, you know, the, the Ephesians sixing this thing and just like, rah, like Lord, and like, should I go to battle? Confuse them, God, like freaking out. I would love to see if somebody recorded me in all these different prayer times. <laughs> it would be awesome. I've also seen the demonic on that same corner. Literally, demonic visitation that I had when I first got saved, I saw that same demon on that corner. So I know it's going down. But I remember this one time, I just said, God, thank you for this city. And I cannot explain to you how filled with the spirit I was with those simple words. Like he, it was unexplainable. And all I did was say, God, thank you for this city. And he basically, I was like, I was like walking two feet off the ground, spiritually speaking, in my emotion anyway. I was just like, wow, what is going on? And God's like, I've been waiting for you to say that. Like, why didn't you just tell me? I would have been happy to. And then not long afterwards, as I was praying for God to interpret the tongue that I speak, he gave me this word. Praise the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. Thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Thank God for his steadfast love. Come on, somebody. Are we not thankful for his always never-ending, persevering, always chasing love? That kind of love of the father that embraces the prodigal son, that sees you running towards him with your, with your speech of guilt and fear and shame, but runs towards you and says, let's have a party? That kind of steadfast love is the love that God has for us. And in my tongue that God has given me, it's continually thanking him for that love. You know what's funny? His thankfulness is super hard for me. Just in the random. It's something that God has been teaching me over the last few years. And the whole time, my spirit, without me knowing, was praying that thankfulness to God. Come on now. Isn't God good? So pray that you may interpret your gift of tongue. Verse 20. Through 25, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking mature. So very clear exhortation, be infants in evil, but be mature about your thinking and spiritual things. Verse 21, in the law it is written, by people of a strange tongues, by people of strange tongues and by lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even when they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Um, and even when they do not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, verse 22, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Well, prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, they're the whole, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophecy in an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all and he's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What's interesting about this is that he quotes Isaiah 28, 
using a very difficult text to interpret what his meaning in is. So tongues and prophecy, are they for believers or not? Because it seems like it says that right here, prophecy is for unbelievers, or, or tongues is for unbelievers. Like, it's like, what is going on with this text? Well, the context is Isaiah 28. The prophecy is to the northern kingdom of Samaria, by which Isaiah the prophet is prophesying that the Assyrians are coming, and what he's saying in Isaiah 28 is with the language they do not understand, they will be led to captivity. And it's a sign of judgment. Therefore, Paul's point is if people that are checking out the claims of Christ come to church and they walk into a bunch of people speaking a language they don't understand, well, they say, aren't you, you're out of your minds and leave, therefore missing the only way to come out from under the judgment, which is Christ. See, Paul's making a very clear, very anchored within the Old Testament point. And it, it's a little on the scary side. Because I know many churches, I have good friends that all speak in tongues during service. And what he's saying is, is that when you're doing this, you're bringing judgment to unbelievers. It's a sign. Because they're gonna think you're out of your minds and they're not gonna be able to receive the most important thing of all. The thing that's above prophecy, the things that are above tongues, the things that are above preaching and teaching, is it not the gospel message by which the most beautiful miracle of all is that someone becomes a new creation in Christ? And that's his point, is that he quotes Isaiah 28 to say, don't do that. Don't speak in a large group, speaking in tongues, because unbelievers will come in and it will work as a sign to that unbeliever. But prophesy by all means, because they'll be able to, as Paul said, I'd rather speak five words that you can hear over 10,000 words you don't understand. Why? Because it leads people to Christ. It instructs people on how to find and follow Christ. That is his point. Verse 26 through 28 says this. And just so you know, I did that. So on my ser- so underneath the video around Tuesday, there's not only the sermon notes that I'm preaching from, but there's also going to be a ton of notes, including an outline chapter of, of uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology of chapter 52, speaking on these things and a whole article he wrote just on the context of Isaiah 28 in the section that I just talked about. It is a heady read, so be ready. But if you want to study that more, by all means, jump into those notes. They'll be there by Tuesday, and you can study for yourself. All right, verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together... Each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, a, a tongue <laughs> or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or, th- or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to who? To God. And so similar to what we had before where you had two commands with the description in between, we're gonna just run through that one more time. So the first thing we see is let all things be done for building up. Let all things be done for building up. And then very specific instructions. When you are in church, okay? That's the context. When you are in church, when you are gathered together, Two or three at most, and each in turn. So number six, point six, those that have the gift of tongues, two or at most three within a church service, and each in turn. In other words, they're not interrupting each other. Number seven, let someone interpret. Number eight, no interpreter, keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Like, it's really hard to get around this one. Because he's so specific. 
Now, is he saying that tongues are a less than? No, he's saying within the context of church, if you have the gift of tongues, keep silent in church and do your prayer and your praise to God in the tongue that God has given you silently. And so, like at prayer time on Friday night, I was going crazy. Like an hour before prayer time, I was in here pacing and doing laps around, just praying in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody pray with me. That all these pews would be filled, not for our glory, but because each one of them would represent a soul that will find and follow Jesus. It's just, man, my soul was just being poured out. It's freaking out all by myself in prayer. Just speaking in tongues, doing laps. Getting all Pentecostal and charismatic. But then people started to come in. And if you were one of them, I asked, do you have the gift of interpretation? They both at that point said no. And so I prayed silently, except for when it wasn't in tongues. Simple. This isn't, this isn't brain surgery or rocket science. These are simple matters that are outlined specifically in Scripture. Verse 36. Or was it, um, yeah, chapter 14, verse 36. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only one it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues but all things should be done decently and in order. And so the last one, do not forget, number nine, do not forbid speaking in tongues. And then he says, that again, we have the commands on each side with the information in the middle, but all things should be done decently and in order. So let's recap. Pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Number one, tongues speak to God. They speak mysteries in the spirit. It increases your potential to serve the local church or church. Number four, Paul expressly desires all to speak in tongues. Number five, pray that you may interpret your gift of tongues. And then don't forget, strive to excel, the most important part, building up the church. And then we see all, th- all things done f- be done for the building up. Your entire life for the building up of others. And then number six, two or three at the most, this is in sp- context of speaking in tongues, and each in turn, so they shouldn't be speaking over each other. Number seven, let someone interpret. Number eight, no interpreter. Keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. And number nine, do not forbid speaking in tongues. That all things should be done decently and in order. The end. And so go over these. Like again, these notes will be on the website. Study it for yourself. But here's your application. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Earnestly desire and pray for the gift of tongues. I've already challenged you to pray for prophecy. It says right in the text, especially that you may prophesy. I've already challenged you to try to identify how do you identify your gift. Start jumping in and let others speak into what they see God empowering you to do and notice for yourself and be wise. And then this one, which this wraps up the specifics on gifts, and then next week we're going to summarize and talk about what it means to live into these gifts next week. But this week, pray for the gift of tongues. And if we all end up with the gift of tongues, we will simply search the scriptures. If you all start speaking in tongues at one time, I'm gonna rebuke you. Pretty simple, because I have the scriptures on my side. Two or three at the most, but if we don't have the gift of interpretation, we're keeping it to ourselves. I dare you to pray for the gift of interpretation. 
<laughs> All right. <clears throat> Father, we come to you in Jesus' name in the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord God, that you would empower us, that we could speak in tongues, that we could interpret, that we'd be able to see to your glory and our joy things that are outside of our box, things that are outside of our control. It's one of the reasons why, God, this seems so weird to us because it's not ni nicely packaged and, and it's like it's something mysterious. But God, you're the God of mystery and wonder. And may we never forget and Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would gift some with the gift of tongues, that you would gift some with the gift of interpretation of tongues. And we pray it, Lord God, for the building up of this local church to your glory and our joy. And all God's people said, amen. Communion is on your right and your left. And what you see over there, we're gonna switch it up a little bit because one of our members um, brought up specifically that sometimes when we pass a plate, it's not worshipful. And so what we're gonna do now, instead of passing, passing the plate, is we're simply gonna have the offering box right next to the communion station or the ones in back that during these next few songs that you would see it as an act of worship, that you would see your giving as an act of worship, just like communion, which the bread represents the body broken, the, blood, the juice represents his blood, given for us so that any of this is possible. Yes. is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. And so I would ask that when you take, there's gonna be elders on either side that are available for prayer. Man, just jump in. Have these guys pray that you'd have the gift of tongues. If you still need to confess sin, those little boxes right there are for you to put your sin in as a symbolic reason, if you need to do that before you take communion, do that. If you would please stand. Let's not be so boxed in. Let's worship and not feel like you can't move from your seat other than for communion. Feel led to go pray for somebody? Go pray for somebody. Let's be the body of Christ, amen? Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions or need prayer, send us an email at info at r-church.org. Grace and peace.